don't know what you felt like before you got here, but I pray that God has blessed you and you feel better now. Amen. 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 It is truly my honor to introduce to you the woman of God who's going to bring the word to us this morning. A Reverend Desiree Grogan. Amen. Who really needs no introduction because she has been part of our resurrection family since its beginning. Amen. Come on, give God some praise. So that you will also be aware of her uh, numerous accomplishments, I will share with you from her bio. Amen. Uh, again, uh, to be able to be encouraged to know how God has blessed her in such a mighty, mighty way. Amen. Amen. Uh, Reverend Desiree Grogan is a vibrant associate minister of the ordained clergy at the historic Shiloh Baptist Church here in Washington, D.C. In 1992, she became the first woman to be ordained by the Shiloh congregation since the church's inception in 1863. Give God some praise. <laughs> Hallelujah. She is a native of Washington, D.C., obtained her undergraduate degree in music from Boston University, her master's degree in library and information science at the University of Pittsburgh. Uh, and she uh, received her seminary education at Howard University where she received several awards of distinction. The Ford Foundation Field-Based Fellowship, the Nanny Helen Burroughs Scholar Award, the William O. Carrington Preacher of the Year Award, and the National Dean's List, the 15th edition. She was also the first seminarian to receive the Patricia Roberts Harris Public Affairs Fellow from Howard School of Communication. Under those auspices, she served as a professional intern at the Library of Congress. Uh, upon accepting her call to preach the gospel in 1988, she then went ahead and got her Master's of Divinity degree. She is distinguished as also as the founding member of the Revelations Ministries, and uh, in which she presently is working to, uh, to write a book on uh, the book of Revelation. In several, well, she's doing that presentation, in-depth teaching now in the book of Revelation, and currently engaged in publishing a commentary on the book of Revelation for the believer in the pew and the first volume is due to be published in 2000 or 2020, 2020. Amen. In summary, Reverend Grogan loves the Lord, is committed to the teaching and preaching of God's word, and is zealous in her efforts to prepare the people of God for the second coming of Jesus Christ. Resurrection, I introduce to you Reverend Desiree Grogan. Let's receive her with a warm welcome, a round of applause, and a hearty amen, amen, amen. Now the choir will bless us with a song of preparation, and the next voice you will hear is that of Reverend Grogan. Amen. Give me patience, give me the strength, help me Lord. 
today who made the day before the foundations of the world were laid <laughs> to his son our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ who is the eternal day toward which we pressed Amen. and to the power and presence of the Holy Spirit who is clearly within each one of us and in this place Amen. I bring you greetings first of all from Shiloh Baptist Church the Reverend Dr. Wallace Charles Smith our senior minister and our host of ministerial team of which I am pleased and honored to be a part as well as the congregation we bring you greetings on this first Sunday of the fourth month of the year of our Lord 2019 I greet you especially with Jesus joy today because as you have already heard from Reverend Maxwell that frankly speaking it was 25 years ago in February while your congregation was still meeting in a community center that I was first invited to preach among you. And you were known then as the Baptist members. Somebody in here got the history. Okay. But look what the Lord done done. Let's give God the praise. Look where he's brought us from. Look what he's done for us, for you, and for me. We just have to give God the glory for having brought us from a mighty long way. I would like to thank Deacon Mary Joseph for her gracious communications that have engaged me and kept me engaged even to this very moment. I'd like to thank the ministerial team, Reverend Maxwell, Reverend McPayton, uh, Reverend um, Dr. Poole and Elder Carter, as a matter of fact, for their gracious hospitality uh, to be at home in this pulpit one more time. And I thank God for the jubilant way that the choir has ushered us to the throne of grace. Thank you so much, as a matter of fact, and for the prayers. That and the ushers who have warmly uh, greeted us and ceremonially seated us uh, as we have arrived here in this lovely sanctuary. And we thank God for all that has been done, the reading of the scriptures that we will have now, which have ushered us to this moment of the preaching hour. Without belaboring the hour, I would like for us to turn our attention to a gospel account of which you are familiar, but has, I hope, more to teach us than we've known before. That's God's word for you. It's eternal. It springs eternal always. I'd like for you to turn to Mark's gospel, the 14th chapter, and I'm going to read in your hearing from the New International Version, verses 1 through 9. If it is your custom, out of reverence for the word to stand during the reading, uh, you are welcome to do so at this time. We're looking at Mark's Gospel, the 14th chapter, verses 1 through 9. The word of the Lord. Now the Passover and the festival of unleavened bread were only two days away and the chief priests and the teachers of the law were scheming to arrest Jesus secretly and kill him. But not during the festival, they said, or the people may riot. 
While he, Jesus, was in Bethany, reclining at the table in the home of Simon the leper, a woman came with an alabaster jar of very expensive perfume made of pure nard. She broke the jar and poured the perfume on his head. Some of those present were saying indignantly to one another, why this waste of perfume? It could have been sold for more than a year's wages and the money given to the poor. And they rebuked her harshly. Leave her alone, said Jesus. Why are you bothering her? She has done a beautiful thing to me. The poor you will always have with you, and you can help them when at any time you want. But you will not always have me. She did what she could. She poured perfume on my body before to prepare for my burial. Mm -hmm. Truly, I tell you, wherever the gospel is preached throughout the world, what she has done will always be told in memory of her. Let me repeat the third verse. She did what she could. She poured perfume on my body beforehand mm -hmm. to prepare for my burial. Allow the word of God to reside in your spirit as we go in prayer before we take our seats. Heavenly Father, we just ask you right now to open up our eyes and our ears to what you would have us to hear and know and do from your holy word from this passage. Let your word do what you said your word would do, not return unto you void, but accomplish the purposes for which it has indeed and will indeed be planted, to bear fruit, more fruit, and much fruit to your own glory. Is your servant's prayer now in the name of Jesus, for his sake and to your glory only. Let the church say amen, amen. and amen again. You may take your seats in the presence of the Lord as I ask you to pray with me for a few moments on the subject. The bold testimony of a silent sacrifice. And the subtopic is, don't talk about it, just do it. Let me repeat. This is the bold testimony of a silent sacrifice. And my subtopic is, don't talk about it. Just do it. Jesus was approaching those final hours of his earthly ministry among us, and the atmosphere surrounding the upcoming Passover feast was charged with conspiracy as the scribes and Pharisees were scheming to plot his death. And Judas, even one of his disciples, was planning to betray him into their hands. Now, can you imagine a, getting ready to celebrate and you got all this subterranean stuff going on? It is in the context of this conspiracy that Jesus is making his way toward Jerusalem, setting his face like flint, not only to observe the upcoming Passover in the upper room like we know he will do with his disciples, but he's going to Jerusalem to be the very substance of the Passover feast. For you see, he's going to Jerusalem to be the perfect lamb to take away the sin of the world. He's going to Jerusalem to offer his own body as the unleavened bread of our redemption. And though Jesus was under a lot of stress in those closing days of his earthly ministry around us, he, he, he decided that before encountering the hostility of his enemies, that he was going to engage the hospitality of his friends. In a place just two miles east of Jerusalem, on the eastern slope of the Mount of Olives, a place called Bethany. A place that Jesus would call, like I call resurrection, his home away from home. All right, all right. For it was a place where Jesus often took refuge, and it's best known for the place where he raised Lazarus from the dead. 
It is now this place that Jesus is in the house of one Simon the leper, communing with him with others over a meal, and his disciples are with him. And if I could digress for just a minute on Simon the leper, sometimes our reputations from the past kind of cling to us. Yeah. But you know, I think that because they were able to eat in this leper's house, yeah. that he was basically being called Simon the leper as a testimony that he was no longer that. All right. That his testimony is that he had been victorious over that malady. So our text informs us that while Jesus was in Simon the leper's house along with others and the disciples, a woman comes in with an alabaster jar of perfume called nard. Alabaster was a precious stone and the perfume inside was from an East Indian rare plant. So both the jar and its content were very precious and expensive. And she broke the jar and poured the perfume on Jesus' head. Now our current text doesn't identify who this woman is. But you have to know that the other Gospels do. And from John's Gospel, we learn that this woman is Mary. The Mary who is sister to Martha and the sister to Lazarus. This is that same Mary who always sat at Jesus' feet when he came to town. And whom Jesus had applauded for choosing that good part that would never be taken from her. This is this Mary who now anoints the anointed one. With what can be called a bold testimony of her silent sacrifice. It was bold with the testimony of her faith. It was bold with the testimony of her hope. And it was bold with the testimony of her love for Jesus. But it was silent because during the entire encounter, Mary never says a word. Now you know that's a phenomenon for a woman. Let's just be real. Sometimes when we do things, we like to talk a whole lot about it, don't we? But she never says a word. So what I'd like to do this morning is just spend a few moments looking at the bold testimony of her faith, her hope, and her love, and how she ministers that testimony through the ceremony of a silent sacrifice to her Lord and King, to our Lord and King, as he's on the eve of Calvary. First of all, Mary's bold testimony bespoke her faith, her living faith in Jesus. And we know that faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. So we know that Mary's faith got born at Jesus' feet when she would listen to what he had to say about why he had come and his father's great plan of salvation. And it was probably at his feet that Jesus had told her about his upcoming death. And she had believed. And it was because she had believed that Mary had prepared herself. You see, when you really have faith, you get ready. You don't sit and hold and twiddle your thumbs and, and wait for something to fall out. You are getting ready. You, you're like a, a, a waiter. A waiter doesn't just stand over in the corner. They always are attending to your needs. They're coming to see if you've got everything you need. Do you understand what I'm saying? She prepared herself by acquiring an alabaster jar of the best and the most expensive perfume, which she originally intended to anoint his dead body when the time came. Mm. Yeah. Oh, but I just think yeah. she got an unction yeah. from the Holy Spirit yeah. that instead of waiting until Jesus was dead, she was going to give him proof of her living faith while he yet lived. Yeah. And so in quietness and in confidence, Mary broke that expensive jar of nard and poured it upon Jesus' head. And without saying a word, Mary acknowledged in her actions what the disciples had yet to believe in their hearts. She acknowledged that she believed the awesome truth of Jesus' impending death. Mary let her silent sacrifice bespeak her living faith. She let her actions speak much louder than any words that she could have uttered. She didn't have to talk about it. She just did it. 
for faith without works of sacrifice is dead. We should ask ourselves, if Mary had the faith to accept Jesus' death, do we have the faith to accept his resurrection? If Mary had the faith to prepare for Jesus' departure, do we have the faith to prepare for his second coming? Because one is as true as the other. For if we make time, and I mean make time and take time to sit at the master's feet in diligent Bible study, I know we busy people, you've got schedules, we've got networks, we've got Facebook, we've got a whole bunch of, but if you don't make time to sit at the master's feet, not just here on Sunday, but every day of the week, and if we're not truly applying what we're reading to our lives, we too will also be able to have an ear to hear the Spirit's instruction on how to bring glory to God in all of our various situations and venues. And to be able to do so not tomorrow, not next week, but right now. And we won't have to talk about it. We'll just do it. Because we'll be confident that Jesus knows that our works of service come from a living faith in who he is. Well, you know, in addition to bespeaking her living faith, Mary's bold testimony said volumes about her living hope in Jesus. For you see, faith is the substance of things hoped for. I'm hoping you're connecting these dots here. And surely Mary had every reason to hope that death would not be the last chapter in her Lord's life. Because she had indeed been an eyewitness when Jesus had raised her brother Lazarus from the dead. She had believed Jesus when he said, I am the resurrection and the life. Those who believe in me, even though they die, yet shall they live. And those who live and believe in me shall never die. She had believed in Mary's fragrant sacrifice. Her silent ceremony was indeed a bold testimony of her living hope in her living Lord. One who would not just die, but who would rise again. She poured that perfume on his head, not only to point toward his death, but to point toward the victory of his resurrection over the grave. When according to the psalmist, his God and Father would anoint him with the oil of gladness above his fellows. And when his robes would be all fragrant with myrrh and aloes and cassia, Mary had her silent sacrifice signify her living hope. She let her actions speak much louder than her words could have uttered. She didn't have to talk about it. She just did it. For her living hope is in what she could not see, but what her faith could claim. Her hope of everlasting life in Jesus her Lord for all eternity. Or we should ask ourselves, what has God already done for us that should cause us to have a living hope in our living Lord? Haven't we been eyewitnesses in our own lives and in the lives of those we love to his keeping power, to his healing power, to his delivering power? Y'all too quiet. To his cleansing power, to his power to provide and to protect, to his power to lead and guide and make a way out of no way. Haven't we been eyewitnesses to all of this in our lives ourselves? Don't we have reason to hope in our living Lord and our living God? Or if Mary could hope in the face of Jesus' death, we should be hopeful in the glow of his resurrection and in anticipation of his imminent return. For those who hope in Jesus have the hope of glory in you. Because then we will boldly act upon that hope in works of service fit for a king. And we won't have to talk about it. (laughs) We'll just do it. Confident that Jesus knows the works of service that is coming from a living faith and a living hope in him. And finally, Mary's bold testimony said something about her love for the Lord and it was that it was priceless. When Paul concludes the chapter on love, you know 1 Corinthians 13, he said that between faith, hope, and love, the greatest of these is love, because love is faith and hope in action. So Mary's love for Jesus was not only an unbridled demonstration of her faith and hope in Jesus, but her love was evidenced by the fact that she gave her best and her all. Yes. Yes. 
You know, some folk think that just because Jesus paid it all, mm. that we don't have to do nothing. Right. Oh my. But Mary's response shows us that love for Jesus does not come cheap. It is rather a costly investment of what, of what we make of our time, our talents, our resources, even ourselves. No service is too small, no sacrifice is too great for the King of Kings who gave his all so that all would not be lost. But as I said before, sometimes the bigger our sacrifice, the louder we like to broadcast what we are doing. But we need to take our cue from Mary, who let her silent ceremony bespeak her love, who let her actions speak much louder than any words she could have uttered. She didn't have to talk about it. She just did it because she knew that Jesus knew Right. That her acts of love and faith and hope were coming from out of a heart that truly loved him with her whole heart. The bold testimony of Mary's faith, hope, and love was rendered in the silent sacrifice of her best and her all. And I wish that could be the end of this sermon. But the text won't let me end there. Because there's a warning that takes place when you doing your best and your all. Because the text shows us that just as sure as you and I make this costly investment in our relationship to Jesus, and just as sure as we endeavor to give the King of Kings the glory out of our lives and the glory due unto his holy and worthy name, there will always be those who will seek to audit our service to the Lord. Amen. And if you don't mind, in this tax season, I'm going to call these folk the IRS. The indignant, the ridiculers, and the slanderers of our bold testimony and our silent sacrifice. You see, in verses 4 through 5, our text reveals that the IRS, the indignant, the ridiculers, and the slanderers are not folk outside the church. Jesus. Ah, go ahead. Go ahead. Go ahead. But within the church who are never willing to make a similar sacrifice in their investment in their relationship with Jesus and who have just a little too much to say about yours. These are the folk who exemplify what Paul talks about when he says when you would do good, evil is present on every hand. Yes. And it is disheartening that this evil, this evil of the indignant, the ridiculers, and the slanderers is found among God's disciples. And if you can't say amen, say ouch. Okay. All right, now. You see, the indignant are those among Jesus' disciples who refuse to keep Jesus first and will hate you for doing so. They are they who want to be found in the crowd on Sunday but have no time to sit at Jesus' feet during the week. The ridiculers are those among Jesus' disciples who will judge your fragrant service to the Lord as a waste, as being too much, only because it shows up the insincere, cheap, and shallow nature of their own service. And the slanderers are those among Jesus' disciples who will murmur behind your back, asking who does he or she think she is, or he is, or it doesn't really take all that. They whispered under their breath against Mary's good judgment to give nothing less than her best and her all in service to her Lord, but they themselves, these slanderers, were not willing to do the same. Oh, but I love this text because the next thing that happens is that Jesus conducts his own audit. All right. He indicts the indignant by declaring the poor will be with you always, but you're not going to always have me. He intercedes on Mary's behalf by telling them to leave her alone. For she indeed had kept her priorities in order. Jesus conducts his own audit when he rebukes the ridiculers who deem her service as a waste. And he instead rates her service as a good work 
For Jesus said she has done what she could based upon the boldness of her faith, her hope, and her love. And Jesus conducts his own audit when he shuts the mouths of the slanderers by sanctioning Mary's sacrifice as that that is going to be worthy to be repeated and remembered for all generations. For he promises her wherever the gospel is preached throughout the world, what she has done will also be told in memory of her. You see, who but Jesus would know the boldness of our testimony that undergirds the ceremony of our silent, silent sacrifices. You see, because Jesus himself rendered his boldest testimony in a silent sacrifice on Calvary. Now you may say to me, but he spoke seven last words. Well, let me explain what I mean by silent. You see, he was silent, at, not because he didn't pray, because he did. And his first prayer was, Father, forgive them, yes. for they know not what they do. Yes. He was silent, not because he didn't bless, because he did. He promised a repentant thief a place in his father's kingdom and gave his mother care into the care of his first cousin John. He was silent, not because he didn't feel anguish of soul, because he did, for he cried out, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? He was silent, not because he thought he had lost, but because he knew that he had won the victory over sin, death, hell, and the grave, for he shouted out to Telestai, it is finished, and commended his spirit into his hands. But Jesus was silent when he didn't let the indignant at the cross incite him to anger. He could have called 12 legions of angels and wiped the whole crew out. Jesus was silent when he didn't let the ridiculers at the foot of the cross reduce him to threats of violence. Right, right. Jesus was silent when he didn't let the slanderers cause him to sidestep his sheep-like posture on Calvary's cross. Coming there as a sheep before the slaughter and a lamb before the shearer is silent, he never left his sheep-like And against the backdrop of his silence, Jesus rendered his boldest testimony of faith. For he obeyed his father even to his death. Jesus rendered the, against the, uh, uh, the backdrop of silence his boldest testimony of hope because he laid down his life confident that his father would raise him up again. And Jesus, against the backdrop of his silence, gave us our, our boldest testimony of his love because he offered the costliest sacrifice of all. The blood of his own life. On a cross, he did not deserve to pay a debt he did not owe. Only Jesus knows the sacrifices we make for him. Only Jesus is writing it all down in the Lamb's book of life. Only Jesus is going to read the record clear when all accounts are settled. For in that great day, when the one who was servant of all will be then king of all, yeah, yeah. will conduct his own final audit based on heaven's IRS. All right. Are you ready? For to those who have believed in him and hoped in him and loved him with their best and their all, Jesus will grant the eye of immortality. Oh, all right, all right. Where the indignation will cease and the indignant will be no more. In that great getting up morning, Jesus will grant the awe of rest and reward for all of our service to his glory. And Jesus will grant in that great getting up morning the S of sheer satisfaction, which he will come with his approval when he says, well done, thou good and faithful servant. You've been faithful over a few things. I'm gonna make you ruler over many things. Enter thou into the joy of your Lord. Only what you do for Christ will last. And he has called you and me to serve him with our best and with our all. So let's serve him with a living faith that's born at his feet. Let's serve him with a living hope that knows no defeat. Let's serve him with a living love that does not come cheap. And you don't have to talk about it. 
<laughs> Just do it. And let your actions speak much louder than any words that you could utter. For if we will serve him with the bold testimony of our faith, hope, and love, and if we will serve him with the silent sacrifices of our best and our all, then you have to know that when Jesus is pleased with your service, he'll do all your talking for you. Amen. Notice that Jesus defended Mary throughout this entire encounter, and she never had to say a word. Oh, I just love it that in that great day when we will be approved by our Savior, that he will allow our works to praise us in the gate. And then we will spend all eternity singing his praises all the day long. Oh, if you don't know him this morning as your Lord and Savior, if you don't know the one who gave his best and his all for you on a cross called Calvary, if you don't know that when they pierced him in his side, when he hung his head and died, that he did all that, all that over 2,000 years ago just for you. Wow. If you don't know him, he's inviting you to come not tomorrow, mm. not next week, <laughs> but right now. For today is the day of salvation. And now is the acceptable time. The doors of the church are open. Give the Lord the praise. We'll give the God the praise. So I'll come to you there. Why don't you come?